Thank you very much, Brian. All right, gentlemen, as agreed, I'll try and restrict it to two questions. Um, if we don't get anything from the audience, I'll try and add a third. But please, audience, if any of you have a question, please stick your hand up, because we'd much rather involve you than listen to us carrying on of a conversation we'll be having over cigars last night as well, weren't we? Um, but let's just kick off with some points that have been raised throughout the morning, and in fact, in fact yesterday as well. You know, we've got this plethora. Um, somebody called it the data swamp earlier, and I think we may be on a life raft now. It may even be something a bit, a bit more solid. How do we get to the yacht? How do we rise up above that data swamp to actually begin to use the data to enable targeting and other capabilities in measurement and through to ROI and, and embracing all of that wonderful stuff we've got in that now highly useful data swamp um, to, to bring through more consistent and, 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 mu and more targeted addressable advertising in the future. What, what items in that data, this is a data conference, what items in that data are going to help us? Let's start at the far end, Moritz. Well, I think uh, there are different approaches uh, what kind of data you're looking at. I'm very interested in contextual relevance, uh, which is nothing to do with individuals. It's more about the relevance of the context in which you're showing the ad. And there are some companies around who look from, from a contextual content view. Uh, Grapeshot, Grapeshot is one uh, who you know from the digital world. Um, there's another company in, in, in France called Spideo, who's looking at also from a contextual side. And then what I've shown this morning from uh, publicists uh, from an artificial intelligence, where they analyze the content. They're not using Google, by the way. They're having uh, developed their own technology to analyze the video content. Uh, and that is, Simon, for me, a complete different area of data that has so far not at all been addressed and is really relevant. And the results are flabbergasting, they're great, and if you combine those data points or those results with an individual uh, data points that Sky has today or Experian brings to the table, or Nauhaus brings to the table, I think that is the absolute ultimate uh, scenario. Obviously, Graham. <laughs> Yeah, with that uh, segue, I, I, I agree you. with that. Uh, I agree with a lot of that. I think uh, context, you know, ha historically was the, the the way we targeted um, the, the majority of our marketing, and um, you know, now we, we, we with all this data, we, we we we've got a new way of doing it. But but context will always play a part in in, in our world. Um, for, for us, it's, it's really about trying to provide a, a service that allows an advertiser or, or a client. To, to identify a home, a collection of, of devices, a collection of um, things that we know about a home that, that will allow you to overlay your own data and make sense of it. So, so what, what we've done is we've got to a place where we have something like 1,400, just over 1,400 different attributes you can use to build a, a bespoke audience that fits your brief. Um, but as I said before, more and more it's about, you know, we, we've done everything we can to build that and filter the data that goes into that and make sure it's robust and, and makes sense. But really more and more now it's about uh, advertisers who, who understand their consumers very well, be it through profiling, be it through actual first party data, bringing that into bringing that into play and being able to, to match that with a Sky subscriber is, is hugely beneficial to, to, to every party really. So that, we're seeing more and more of that. And just to put a subsidiary on that before I come to you, Brian, I, I've seen a number of your presentations and, and you, you, you show case studies of uplift, whether that's uplift in brand preference or up, actual uplift in sales. What sort of percentages are you talking about for some of these clients who are using that addressable capability to go directly at a highly targeted behavioral audience? It's probably about 50%. Um, so, so if, if anything, you know, the, the new regulation that's coming in in May and then the e-privacy that's coming in kind of later this year has made the, the, the whole industry quite paranoid. So, so if anything, the, there's a bit more of a focus on to context again as people kind of try and navigate, right, how do I use this data in, in, in the right way and I, I've got the consent set up. But, but there's a huge proportion of, of advertisers. So if you're a, an insurance business and you know you've got 300,000 
people here that are coming up for re insurance renewal, to be able to serve them an ad that's, that's relevant to them and their journey with that product is, is hugely beneficial. And you can see with that kind of closed loop attribution how, how beneficial that can be. So. It's interesting you say insurance. I'm thinking of one of our, our UK clients that did exactly that. But 50% uplift is phenomenal. Mm. Just going back to the original question, Brian, you know, in, in, in terms of how these data points can be leveraged. I think a lot of it, sorry, I think a lot of the opportunity is to try to unify and harmonize so you have a view of what does that audience look like across the media because, again, you can't, you can't have every single data point, but now that you have a lot more relevant information, you can actually measure brand uplift. You don't have to go after pure performance campaigns and limit it to one set of signals. You can start controlling for, it's a lot of the techniques that were used in performance, but you can actually control for behavior by modifying the message across the channels that are available to you. So driving towards um, business outcomes rather than trying to go for narrow, you know, where, where there's only a certain amount of data, broaden that a bit. And, and a subsidiary for you, Brian, no more than 20 seconds though. Um, dynamic ad insertion, how quickly is that going to grow, do you think? Technically, it's capable. I think the challenge is getting the dynamic ads for people to see. Um, I, the, the most overlooked area has nothing to do with data. It's creative. Which then neatly goes across to you, Moritz. Technically, is there an issue with dynamic ad insertion? How, how quickly can it be introduced within the marketplace? Uh, there are some really fantastic solutions, technically speaking, in the market already. And uh, Sky AdSmart, they're, they're using one of them. Uh, which does the server side stitching basically, but the other solutions out there as well, um, well American companies, uh, Ivy Digital, for example, uh, and others uh, from Publicis Agency who, who are doing that on the cloud, uh, doing rendering of 10,000 variations of the same ad. Uh, we've seen here during the last two days uh, some of these examples where the Pepsi one, for example, where the background is being changed. Uh, this is being done on video right now. So it's not fiction. This is not five years down the road. It's more about what, what Brian said. How, do you, how can you make it possible technically to target that audience? How can you identify it? So uh, it's really an um, infrastructure issue. Uh, how can you get the market to move into a direction where what Sky has done with AdSmart uh, could be replicated. There is these standards called HBBTV2 or Sorens and Media uh, who have a solution. Th those solutions need to be implemented to, to make that really happen. Thank you. You've actually answered question three, and we're into the last three minutes, so we can concentrate on two in a second. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to ask a question? Searching desperately for hands. Okay, we'll crack on then. There's one. There's one. There is one. Whereabouts? Where are we? Oh, in, in the middle. Thank, thank you. This is for Brian from Sky. Uh, last week, Facebook announced in the United States that they were questioning their third-party providers, one of which you have listed as a key player that you work with. How do you think the third party is going to continue to play in this conversation over the next few months? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, there are a lot of businesses that, that we, we currently have relationships with who are, who are going through a, a period of audit and review and, and checking that they do have the, the right consent to be able to, to, to provide the data to, to people like Sky. Um, we'll continue to work with Experian. We've, we've, we've done a huge amount of work around GDPR and, and, and getting customer consent. Um, anonymizing and securing data. So we, you know, we, we're in a we're in a comfortable place with it. We um, we, we think that Experian provide a, a, an invaluable um, lens, if you like, of, of, of UK consumers, of, of Europe consumers, and that 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 doesn't really go away for us. We we um, we don't see there being an issue. Um, if I was being a cynic, I'd see I'd say. It, it was more of a statement than it was something that was necessarily a big, big danger to, to, to business um, for, for Facebook, but um, that would be for them to comment on, obviously. Thank you, John. Great, great question. Uh, we'll just go to a final... We're into the final minute now, so we'll just go to some quick answers. Um, ha uh, and it, it broadly, in most cases, we look at, I think, addressable defined as something around 5 to 8% of total TV ad revenue. In, in, in the UK, certainly, it was around that two, in 2016. It's gone up slightly. In the US, 
it's restricted as well. The restriction is the availability of inventory. And as was talked about earlier, I think during the Warner Brothers discussion, um, we, it's remnant inventory sometimes can be looked at as addressable. Is it moving out of that remnant inventory now? Is it, get, is it becoming proper? And is there a bright future? Is there a for addressable TV? Or it's no, no, it's a Graham question. <laughs> go on. Go on, Graham, you go first. Yeah, uh, I'll speak quickly. Yes, um, the, there's, you know, the, the, absolutely. Um, we're seeing, you know, loads of different uses and, um, the, the, you know, we, we, we very much focus around serving ads into premium content. Um, it's not remnant. It's, it's not stuff that we can't already sell, and there's loads of it. This is a 10-second now down to five seconds. <laughs> yeah, so, so I would say I definitely see it growing. You see a lot of opportunities coming from linear um, and broadcast providers, um, different solutions, so yes. I think UK is the, the leader in this segment, uh, US second. And then uh, we see lots of uh, Asian market, for example, in China, uh, where I see a, a huge potential rising. Fantastic. Optimism, future growth. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank your speakers.